Good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Amrita Balachandra. I have a very exciting conversation that's coming up right now because I'm going to be talking about a young girl who has been nominated for the Global Citizen Prize Cisco Youth Leadership Award. Let me tell you a little bit about 26-year-old Suhani Jalota before we go into our guest who is the founder of Maina Mahila Foundation. She has been nominated for Global Citizen Prize Cisco Youth Leadership Award and that's a big deal because she's one of the only Indians to be nominated and uh, in fact one of the three finalists uh, for the Global Citizen Prize Award. The voting process for this is currently underway. But let me also tell you the other list of accolades that she's got already. So Hani Jalota has already received a number of awards and that's pretty remarkable uh, because she's a Forbes Asia under 30 recipient of 2018, Asia 21 leader 2019 award. She's also a Young Achievers Mother Teresa Memorial Awardee 2018 and she also won the Queen's Young Leader 2017. Suhani is currently studying at the Stanford University in California and despite the time difference, she's been very kind enough to give us time right now and speak to us about her foundation. We'll talk about the nomination. We'll also talk about the foundation, what her plans are uh, for the future. Suhani, many thanks for uh, joining us right now and uh, taking time out to talk to us. First of all, congratulations on the nomination. I want to ask you this first because it's about the foundation right uh, and this is a big deal if you can first of all tell us about the foundation i know the foundation was started in 2015 but take us through the work that you do and what made you start the foundation thank you so much amita i really really appreciate this and for having me on the show um so mena mela foundation is a very special organization started by grassroots level. So it's a, it's a grassroots level organization started by the very women who it is for. So I was 15 when I first met the women who changed my life. Um, and at the time, I met the woman with whom we founded the organization five years later. Um, and at the time, uh, this was 2010, 2011, I had started to go to the Dharavi slums um, and then also to, the, also to the Govandi slums in Mumbai, where constantly, I mean, day in and day out, I'd, I'd hear stories and I'd see cases of women just sort of having a lot of abuse uh, that they were facing at home and publicly, where they were walking to public toilets and men were counting the number of times they were going to the toilet. They were being mentally and sexually harassed on the way. Um, there was there were cases of just girls talking about how they just are not allowed to go to school and this is just not something that they even consider or bring up at home. Um, there were cases of girls just saying that, you know, we don't, you know, why are you talking about something like periods? Like this is not something that we ever talk about. And if we don't talk about, um, if we don't talk about our own periods, we can't talk about our bodies. We don't talk about ourselves very much. And then there's a constant theme of just women not prioritizing themselves at home and then somehow feeling that they don't have agency over their lives and that somebody else is controlling this. Um, and so we started to realize that we had to do something that made women just feel like they could they could speak up, that they could step up and they could change their lives. And this was actually under their own control and nobody else's. Mm -hmm. um, so we called ourselves MENA. MENA is the bird, right? Like Tota MENA that speaks a lot because we want women to talk about the issues they're most afraid to discuss aloud. And we think that that's a really clear way of starting to break a lot of the taboos that are holding women back right now. And if you start breaking the taboo on issues like menstrual health, and around your periods, then you become a lot more comfortable suddenly to talk about issues like domestic violence and just essentially holding up your hand and being like, wait, this is not normal um, or that you can't do this to me anymore just because I have my own rights and I can speak up and I can ask, ask more. Hmm. And so I think that's really the premise of Mena Mahila Foundation, that since we have since we were founded, we want to be a voice for the women in urban slum communities where they're often very invisible. And over time, we've developed uh, into three separate arms where we have MENA Health, MENA Employ, and MENA Research. And all three have, are all going towards the same mission, is that we want to make sure that women are confident, they're able to speak up, they're able to prioritize their health, and they're financially independent. So we can provide them with employment directly or provide them with employability skills. 
I also want to talk to you about what you found in those slums, and it's important to talk about the backstory uh, and your story as well, and the women in your life. Did it somehow resonate what you found in the slums? Did it uh, resonate with uh, you, perhaps some stories from your uh, life itself? Because you talk about coming from a patriarchal family. Yeah, um, I think it was twofold. So. I come from a North Indian family uh, from Lucknow, uh, and getting the way in which my parents, um, particularly mother, and then also just other women in the family, were brought up, uh, was that you sort of have to um, abide by somebody else's rules, and that you again don't make your own decisions. You again don't have agency. Um, my grandmom couldn't have her own career, even though she very well could have. Um, so I think constantly seeing that, and then having a mother who is extremely rebellious and who did everything that normally people in her family would never do um, by going out and working and never essentially taking a day off from work, and then seeing her and somehow how she struggled, I just felt that everything was just so unfair. And then I saw so many other mothers who became my mothers in the Islam community, um, like Pareen Aunty, Amri Aunty, like all these women. I saw how they had to give up their own lives, and this was happening right in front of me. And I felt that somehow, maybe we had some control over it, and we had to help them realize how much control they had over their lives. So, it definitely sprung from uh, a very personal family experience. And then I think secondly was I had uh, experiences with, um, you know, when I was I was I had a major illness for which I had to go to the hospital constantly, and I started to realize how there are so many health inequities where I was able to get treatment for certain things that my uh, peers or people in the neighboring beds even could not even afford. Um, and just this lack of access to basic amenities that create a matter of life and death, I think it just all sort of came together. When I started to see such inequity happening then, particularly towards women, it just was something that, Had so much of activist energy burn, burning up in me that this is just not this is just not uh, to be like you just can't accept something like this at all and that we have to stand up and we have to speak up. And and when you talk about menstrual hygiene and sanitation and we're going to put up some data on the screen as well. There are reports that say that only twenty percent of women actually wear sanitary pads because of lack of access, lack of awareness, that sort of a thing. So what what did you find in your conversations with women on ground? Yeah, um, actually, the problem of menstrual health is so much more complicated than basic access to menstrual products, and I think that a lot of the popular dialogue has made this topic very glamorous. And so, I mean, in in a way, that's great in that we're creating a lot of awareness around the basic issues, around basic access to menstrual products, whether it's sanitary napkins, whether it's cloth pads, whether it's Uh, just using any sort of cloth at all, uh, whether it is tampons or cups, whatever it may be. Um, but however, we have a very little data that actually proves most of the statistics that we see here. Um, the one statistic that we were that we had used, where about 88 percent of Indian women did not have access to sanitary napkins, uh, wow. was actually from a study by A. C. Nielsen with about 1,200 girls in some rural part of Rajasthan, and that study is nowhere to be found. You can't even click on it anywhere; it's nowhere online. But that statistic was used by everyone, from Padman to BBC to UNICEF to like. All kinds of various uh, media channels as well. Hmm. The other data point that we have is the National Family Health Survey. The National Family Health Survey data actually shows that about 54% of women have access to these these products. Again, the way the question is asked in these questionnaires is a multiple answer, multiple choice. So essentially, if you're using sanitary napkins, but you're also using cloth alongside that, which we have heard a lot every time we go on the ground and we hear that girls when they're at home they use cloth, when they step outside they'll start using pads. Um, mm-hmm. So in such cases, you're still recording the case as women are using pads. So we need to be sort of clear on what are we ultimately aiming for? Are we ultimately aiming for a scenario where women are just using sanitary napkins, and is that really the way to go? And is that even solving the problem of menstrual health altogether? So from our studies, actually, we've found that amongst the study that we did among 1,600 girls in just the Govindi area. Um, it was just a small sample survey. We found that about 79% of the girls were using sanitary napkins, which is a very shocking statistic because much, much higher than what you would normally imagine. However, the issue here is not that they're not using pads. The issue is how they're using those pads. So if you actually dig deeper and you ask them, well, okay, so if you're using pads, how many hours are you wearing a single pad for? And then they'll tell you things like 12 hours, 24 hours. 
sometimes even longer than a day and hmm. that's what's concerning it's the usage of the napkin that we don't discuss and we don't ask about in a lot of these surveys because it's so much more complicated to try to explain because now this is now much more than just access to napkins now this involves education awareness and advocacy for which you require a lot more consistent sustainable efforts by providing education in schools to girls which by the way has really uh, been banned i think across the country and across various states because we are not trying to promote sexual reproductive health education in schools for girls so often times actually girls have their first period and they have no idea why they've had their first period so i think that at, at various levels um the statistics a we don't know how true or not they are two i don't think it's about access to sanitary napkins we are way beyond that we need to be discussing the nuances of the topics and t- talking about issues of disposal and the taboo around actually purchasing products and how the usage of the products happen and the benefits of using certain products and explaining this and educating the the population about it so mm-hmm. i think that we actually started off by trying to solve the access problem but in conversations with women on the ground realize this is more of an education problem and that's why and, a lot of our programming is really focused on education yes and is that something that you're trying to do and a very important point you made about the fact that most people um most women don't know about the first period only after uh, are they uh, told yeah. and this happens in urban areas as well uh, and that's a very very important point but so right now are you focusing on education as well uh, to uh, you know yeah. uh, mothers to uh, tell families to also educate young girls and it's more it's it's you're saying that it's gone more beyond just access to sanitary pads because you started out distributing sanitary pads as well and you will probably be scaling that up as well right uh, no that yeah so all of those points are super important we have um, education around menstrual health uh, that is happening in schools in colleges so among girls that are like 12 all the way up until actually we have for women in your menopause as well so up until like 40 45 as well and for men and boys to support their sisters and their mothers um as well so i think it's across the the gamut and and we've realized that because this is such a personal issue girls often times even if they're coming to our sessions and they and we educate them about these topics and then they go back home they feel very shy to discuss this with anybody else and then they forget about it and it's not something that they're hearing about in any other channel and so they actually don't remember many of those things so oh. then we started to invite the mothers and the sisters and the aunts and the bhabis and everybody to come together and we were like nahi aap sabko le aao sari jo ladkiyan hain aapke aas padose mein bhi hain unko bhi le aao so then everybody would then come together and then we would teach them all together and then once you have a community of people that you're going home back with then you can start continuing these conversations and then the conversations don't end where they started only so i think we've really tried to make sure that this is something that uh, is is more uh, group oriented as well and we 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 really tailor it for the very um, communities and how the norms in those communities work we can't break norms i think that's the very audacious thing to do and we've we've tried initially we really went in being like no no like this is you should be praying during your period you should be doing all of this and then we realized oh my god that like nobody is listening uh we have to really work around and and make them realize that they can control whatever they want to do whether they whether they pray or they don't pray it's up to them but we should just give them facts also i want to talk to you about your inspiration uh, because you speak about dr jokin arputa many times uh, you've done that in 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 a couple of other articles as well uh, if you can tell us how he inspired you to become the person you are today yeah wow i'm quite impressed that uh, you picked up on that um dr jokin arputa has been a mentor and honestly the person who taught me just everything that i know about participatory approaches and how we are not here as saviors to try to save or help women uh who who might be suffering or who might be experiencing a lot of uh disabilities in their lives but mm-hmm. we are just here to help them help themselves and that we i mean there were times when i would in my first few months of uh, working in the slums i would just come home every day for 2 to 3 hours and just bawl my eyes out but i can't believe that women are being beaten up and i'm seeing that these girls are being beaten up and i can't do anything and they're not saying anything and how can we live in such a place and how is nobody else saying anything and he'd always tell me that sohani this is like if you take these issues so subjectively and you start becoming so sentimental about them you will not be able to help anyone around you 
if anything you're the only one benefiting from here because you're learning new things and a lot of people end up going in getting exposed learning these things feeling helpless and then they leave or they do some sort of a bandaid solution and that's not the way to create sustainable change you'll have to go in and you'll have to see these really horrifying stories be objective about them don't make emotional decisions think strategically about really how can this woman who's suffering so much actually stand up on her on her own two feet and decide to take control of her own life so i think that his constant perspective his constant push back to so every time i was feeling very low or i was i was completely lost i think he would always um give me the right type of outlook and perspective that is so important especially when it's so easy to feel helpless and you feel like you don't know where to start he really gave me a lot of starting points um and he always showed me the power of women together um so it was always about the mahila milan so that was the organized self help groups that he ran that he when women come together then no matter how many men are harassing how many women it doesn't matter at all because women together is the most fearful powerful force in the world and mm-hmm. that's what we want to create and that's really what men are trying to build as well let's also talk about um queen's young leaders award in 2017 that was a big deal the conversation that you had with queen elizabeth to herself and subsequently also megan markle visited your uh, ngo what was that experience like because these are the uh, uh, things that sort of keep you going <laughs> right yeah this these were all very surreal experiences um and in fact they happened very early in our uh, ngos career so i mean we've we've been around for 5 years as an organization um and i first met megan markle in 2016 which was just one year after we founded um and it so happened that we met in new york at a glamour college women of the year award ceremony where they had uh, called 10 girls in and um each of us 10 girls was paired with a mentor and she was a mentor to another girl actually at the event and they had given me the grand prize so they had announced about mena and the work that we were doing in the issues of menstrual health in india uh, which are just very stark and so i think she really was inspired from uh, from by that and then she wanted to come to india and then she came came to india and actually in the meantime um i had also so the separate program the queen young leaders program uh through which um we you know we met the queen and um it was just like at this whole experience and both of these experiences actually put men on a global map and mm-hmm. people started to know us people started to think that we are credible um i'm a young girl when i started mena i was 19 and you know at the time people don't take you seriously um and this was a huge credibility boost a huge confidence boost for me and everybody else in the organization um and two of the women from men actually went with me to the royal wedding um to meghan markle's wedding and that experience i mean changed their lives for sure but when they came back i mean they recounted all kinds of stories to all the other women and they were so much more convinced that what we are doing we're doing it in the right direction because see people are also recognizing this and you know even we don't realize what how special you know when the kind of work that we're doing how special it really is until you actually hear others even tell this to you and you're like wow i mean for me this is like this is our daily life this is what we do all the time but actually what we're doing every day we're impacting so many girls lives that like we should pause and reflect and realize how special that is and i think that these kinds of um these kinds of events meeting the queen and megan markle coming in have really made us just realize that you know let's let's actually sometimes celebrate and it's it's good and it also motivates us to keep going on and working on these really tough challenges because there are such important people also backing us which is which is really nice and and the nomination uh, for global citizen prize is yet another big deal and i'm going to end with this of course the voting process is underway but the award prize is $250,000 tell us this how important is that going to be for mina and in terms of you know uh, your vision for mina as well what what is the foundation going to do if you will yeah so the the cisco uh, the cisco prize is actually so yes. helpful and so important for us at this stage where we are 5 years old and we are planning our next 5 years um our next 5 years are all about scale and reaching out to 2 million women by 2025 um and this goal for us uh, has to do with improving access to menstrual health products and services to 2 million women as well as shifting health behavior um due to the covid time has really 
showed us that a lot of the in person contact i mean we would have 100 200 girls come in minimum at every session that we would host now that's not possible anymore and we don't know up until when that's not possible and so we're actually building a digital network and we're building and we're using data driven technology platforms to create the first time ever women networks within slum communities on a mobile phone and this is using both smartphones as well as an interactive voice recording system uh, technology for for basic phone users as well and this is to help women uh, with telemedicine uh, queries This is to help women with bad queries, bad ordering, um, for inputting their data about their their period cycles as well, um, and at the same time watching videos and any content on menstrual health and any other aspect of their of their bodies as well. Um, so this is part of a a, a program that we're launching uh, called the Mena Launchpad. and this has an abcd model of access and this is what we pitched to the cisco uh the cisco prize for 250k um which is that it helps us actually reach 250k women directly contributing to this mission 2 million women by 2025 and the abcd model of access stands for the a stands for um the app that we are building um and we've launched mm-hmm. and we beta type they're actually beta testing it right now with about a few hundred girls um and atm uh which is essentially a pad type of vending machine but it looks more like a fancy food machine and this is going to be placed in various public toilets um and this is essentially uh taken care of by the caretaker um for b we have bus system and these buses are essentially for rats to go girls for street girls we were traditionally we're actually not able to support them right now because they can't travel to a center where we are so we will go to them instead and that's the whole point of the bus the education on wheels of menstrual health c is our centers our physical centers where we want to expand our physical presence in the poorest and the lowest income communities where this education and awareness is extremely important and our center physical space is actually the most important space to do that i think we've realized that over time that having an only women space in a slum is extremely rare or even non existent and women love it and they come to us for now anything and we want to create more and more such open open free spaces for women C also stands for chemist shops where we'll keep our pad products in the chemist shops as well and then D stands for door step access so that's where even if you can't avail our products through any other means we'll come to you at your doorstep and this is traditionally what we've been doing up till now and we've reached 500,000 women at the doorstep up till now and that's what we want to scale now all over india um and the global citizen prize can really help us kick start that new program to scale nationally using these digital networks Absolutely, I mean that sounds very, very uh, inspiring. More power to you, uh, Suhani. Also, all the best. We're going to put up the link where uh, people who are watching right now can also vote in the description below. Uh, but all the best to you, and thank you so much for making time to speak to us.